Pastor Cameron DeVazier. Today I want to share a message with you entitled, The Woman at the Well. But before we study God's Word in any capacity, of course, let's always begin with a word of prayer. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you give us life at all, and we can spend this time together. And now, as we spend a few moments in your Word, we would ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to give us the wisdom that you want us to have. Help us to see the truth as you want us to see it. And more importantly than a mere understanding of biblical truth, Lord, help us to apply these truths in our lives. Give us the wisdom that we need to win souls for you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take out your Bibles and go to the book of John. The Gospel of John, and we're going to go to chapter 4. Gospel of John, chapter 4. This is the, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry here on earth, the earliest stages of it. John the Baptist had just baptized him, and he and Jesus and his disciples who had been ministering nearby John and his disciples for a brief sliver of time, a little window when those two were working contemporaneously. And we record, it records here in John chapter 4 that apparently there was a rift between John's disciples or the perception of John's disciples and the perception of Jesus' disciples and that Jesus was becoming more popular, John was fading away, and it was becoming a bit of a trouble. And so we read here in John chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Okay? Now, that's not uncommon for a Jewish person to go from Judea to Galilee. But in so doing, if you're familiar with the geography, in order to go from Judea to Galilee, the straight shot would take you through Samaria. And Jews of that time did everything in their power to avoid Samaria and Samaritans. There was a long-standing rift between these two cultures, these two groups, and they had no love lost for each other, had no respect for each other, and typically what would happen if someone needed to go from Judea to Galilee, they would go the roundabout way around Samaria. I'm guessing that's what Jesus' disciples expected he would do with them. But in John chapter 4, notice again what it says, verses 3 and then 4. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. And it doesn't say he happened to go through Samaria or he decided just to walk through instead of going around for the sake of convenience or for the sake of any other thing. It specifically says that he needed to go through Samaria. Of course, good Jews, as you would think of at that time, never had a need to go through Samaria. They needed to go around Samaria. But here Jesus specifically indicates that he needed to go through Samaria. So that's exactly what happened. Now, we'll come back to this point later. What was the great need? Why did Jesus see the necessity of going through Samaria when his ultimate destination was Galilee? Why did he need to go through here? Well, I believe the Bible gives us the explanation, but we'll put that concept, that question, on a shelf for now in the back of our minds, and we'll revisit it later. But Jesus now, needing to go through Samaria, does just that, and we pick up the story in John 4, verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Then it adds, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, why would Jesus... You get the picture, of course. His disciples, they've all stopped there for a moment, and they've gone off to the local town to get food. Jesus is sitting by the well, and he's just sitting there, and up comes this woman, obviously a Samaritan woman, and Jesus 
has a request for her. Now, typically, those two religious groups, if they saw individuals representing them, if they were, saw a Samaritan and a Jew next to each other, you would not expect them to be engaged in conversation. In fact, just like you would avoid going around Samaria, you would absolutely avoid conversation with a Samaritan. So maybe there might be a recognition that they're there and an avoidance and going, walking the long way around or just kind of turning your back or some sort of averting your gaze. But Jesus, Jesus just like his journey, here at the well doesn't settle for what typically might be done. Instead, he speaks directly to her and he says something fascinating. Very brief, but he says, give me a drink. Now, you would typically think that Jesus, being the kind and gentle one that he was, he loved children, he talked about lambs and flowers and grass and all kinds of nice, docile, pleasant things. He would be a man of great manners, and he would certainly offer to help this woman out. But that's not what he does. He asks this woman to give him a drink. What is he doing? What is Jesus happening? What's going on with Jesus here? We get added insight from the Desire of Ages, page 183. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus. So if this had been a Samaritan man she had seen sitting there, she absolutely would have offered him a drink. Can I help you out, sir? What can I do for you? Would you like a drink? Let me draw water for you. But no. She's doing what would typically be anticipated in an interaction between a Samaritan and a Jew, and she's avoiding him altogether. Notice again the language. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus, but the Savior was seeking to find the key to this heart. And with the tact born of divine love, he asked, not offered, a favor. So it wasn't meanness or spite or he wasn't looking down on her and treating her with less dignity or respect. No, no, instead the opposite. He's looking for a way to address this woman, to get her attention, to enter into conversation with her. And the words there, with a tact born of divine love, he asked, not offered, a favor. Why would that be? Well, it's very simple. It's easy to say no to an offer of help, but it's hard to refuse someone who's asking for your help. The offer of a kindness might have been rejected, but trust awakens trust. Oh, friends, there's a principle for us to keep in mind right there in our interactions with other people. Trust awakens trust. If Jesus said, can I give you a hand? Oh, no, thank you, that's it. Conversation over, she refuses, end of discussion. Moment lost. But by Jesus saying, can you give me a hand? Can you get me a drink? She is forced to dialogue more. She's forced into a situation where further conversation can happen. By the way, I, I, I would imagine you find the same thing even today. If you want to interact with strangers, do a fun little uh, sociology experiment. Go down to a store and offer to help people with their bags and see how many people take you up on it versus having handfuls of things and asking for help from people around you. If you look like you're in need and you say, can you help me, I guarantee you'll have more takers on that than you will if you just randomly start offering to help other people with their needs. People are humble and shy usually and don't want to be engaged. Oh, I can handle it myself. I wasn't anticipating the help. But if you have a need, people willingly will help out. Jesus understood this. Trust awakens trust. He wanted to build a bridge of trust with this woman. Can you give me a hand wins far more interest than can I give you a hand. Christ was being shrewd, being brilliant. Let me share with you a little experience. I had the opportunity to be in Switzerland a while back, and I was speaking at an event, and of course, I don't know the language there, and this particular part of Switzerland didn't just speak German, it spoke Swiss German. Now, the translator that was there working with me was from Germany, and he didn't particularly speak Swiss German that well either. 
And lo and behold, we decided to go on the outreach event when we went door to door asking people or inviting them to a set of meetings. And I, of course, don't know the language at all, and he didn't know the language that well. And wouldn't you know, of course, that we would get teamed up together. And so we had a little map, we had our little bag of goodies that we were supposed to hand out to people, and we were dropped off at this one location. And there we were, Switzerland, neither of us being fluent in the local language, trying to get from point A to point B and distribute with conversation these goodies that we have and invite people to meetings that we we're holding. So what to do? Well, first of all, we had a difficult time reading the map. And so as we went along, it wasn't long at all before we realized we were quite lost. So what we had to do, we had to ask people for help. And there were some people walking along the sidewalk and we said, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am, could you please help us and give us direction? We're trying to find on this map where we need to be. And we found out that the very first person we talked to was more than willing to engage in conversation because we needed their help. And sure enough, they were able to help us out and show us the road signs and say, now you need to go this way and this way we'll go over here and kind of get us back on course. And we said, oh, thank you so much. Here, we'd like to give you this gift and invite you to some meetings. And they said, oh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. And we had a great interaction. And then we were off. Well, it didn't take long until we got lost again. And sure enough, we needed to find another person. And we found someone else walking along the street or the sidewalk there. And they had the exact same experience. We asked them for help, and they were more than happy to open up a dialogue, to talk with us. Ask, now, where are you from? What are you doing? What are you going around the neighborhood for? Oh, well, we want to invite people to meetings. That sounds so kind. Thank you so much. And the rapport was very easy. It flowed very naturally. And it didn't take us long before we discovered that our best experiences were with those people who, who we needed their help. So we noticed that we got all of our materials handed out and all of the invitations given as we went from person to person asking for help. Now, I would love to someday design an outreach program where we do that. You have a fun scavenger hunt going from point A to point B, and you have to stop along the way and ask people for their assistance. And you'll probably get just as good interactions, if not better quality interactions, by starting with the premise that you need help instead of offering help to others. Jesus knew this, and this is his approach to the woman at the well. Now we continue on. This dialogue finally opens up, and things get really going. The woman kind of obfuscates, and Jesus tries to uh, come into the close to the heart, and she would back away and come close and back away. And, and finally, look at verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she doesn't want to get into the discussion where Jesus is going. She's trying to push him away, and, uh, but it'd still be kind. He says, well, look, here's the thing. I know that the Messiah is coming. And you may be a Jew and I may be a Samaritan, but there is a Messiah coming. And when he comes, he'll tell us all things. And notice what Jesus says to her. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, this must have been a radical concept for this woman to hear. That she's been talking about the Messiah with little realization that she's been speaking to the Messiah. We read in Desire of Ages, page 190. As the woman heard these words, faith sprang up into her heart. She accepted the wonderful announcement from the lips of the divine teacher. This woman was an appreciation was in an appreciative state of mind. She was ready to receive the noblest revelation, for she was interested in the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit had been preparing her mind to receive more light. This is part A to our answer why Jesus needed to go through Samaria, because there was a divine appointment awaiting him. He knew through the power of the Holy Spirit leading in his life every day, that there was a divine appointment, an arranged, scheduled meeting that he needed to go to. Now, he could have gone around Samaria and just effectively gotten to Galilee with no controversy, no discussion whatsoever, but he needed to go through Samaria. The Holy Spirit apparently had been working on this woman's heart for quite some time, she had been studying the scriptures. She was anxious to know the truth, but from the context you read that she was not living in a lifestyle that she was very proud of. 
She was convicted of her wrongdoing, wanted to be drawn to the Messiah, but was not clear on who he was. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. This woman was in an appreciative state of mind. She was ready to receive the noblest revelation for she was interested in the scripture and the Holy Spirit had been preparing her mind to receive more light. Jesus arrived just in time to appeal to this woman's sense of conscience, her woman's, this, this woman's need at the moment. And he revealed to her, I am the Messiah. Now, how do we know that this conversion, this experience that the woman has, was genuine? Because there is at least one genuine evidence that accompanies every true conversion, and that is a missionary zeal to bring others to Jesus. Still in the Gospel of John, now go down to verse 27. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he had talked with a woman, yet no one said, why do you, who, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Look what she does in the meantime, verse 28. Then the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. They went out of the city and came to him. Notice that she becomes the messenger for Jesus. Again, Jesus doesn't go directly to these people and says, everyone, I am the Messiah. Come on over here and we'll have a talk together. No, 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 no. He speaks to one person and that person becomes his agent to bring more people. The genuine evidence of true conversion is missionary zeal to bring others to Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 191. The woman had been filled with joy as she listened to Christ's words. The wonderful revelation was almost overpowering. Leaving her water pot, she returned to the city to carry the message to others. With heart overflowing with gladness, she hastened on her way to impart to others the precious light she had received, and her words touched their hearts. There was a new expression on her face, a change in her whole appearance. They were interested to see Jesus. Please make note of that. Because of seeing her, they were interested in hearing him. It was her testimony, her change of position, her change in appearance, her change in demeanor, her forms of expression, her excitement, her zeal that made them interested in seeing Jesus. She was so interested in Jesus that others became interested in Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but people who come into the truth of God's word and see new light founded directly on the scripture, they have a personal encounter with Jesus, they have their sins forgiven, they're walking in the newness of life. New people can't shut up. You can't get them to stop talking. If they lean, learn new light, if they learn the truth about the seventh day Sabbath, if they learn the truth about the state of the dead or the second coming of Jesus, or, or they get excited about the prophecies they've been learning, they can't stop talking about it. They'll go around at their workplace or with their home life. They'll go around their friends, their families, their neighbors, their coworkers. By the water fountain at work, they're going to be, somebody's going to say, how about that game this weekend? He said, well, what about the mark of the beast, brother? Like, you can't get them to stop. The same is true with this woman at the well. She, there's no way that she's going to just meander on back to the city and happenstance, oh yeah, I happened to meet this one guy. I think he said he was the, what's the word? Oh yeah, Messiah. No, 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 no. This is the number one thing in her mind. It's the thing that she can't get out of her mouth fast enough. I've seen the one who could be the Christ. You need to see him too. She was so interested that others became interested. And this is how the word of God is supposed to spread. Desire of Ages, page 195, continuing the commentary. As soon as she had found the Savior, the Samaritan woman brought others to him. Notice this now. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. When they came into that city, what were they looking for? All right, here's a well. Let's go get some food. Let's get the shortest route out of here. We got to get to Galilee. They weren't thinking about Samaria. They weren't thinking about Samaritans except on how to avoid them. 
But this woman went right back to the heart of Samaria, went to this town of Sychar, and said to everyone there, you've got to meet this man. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. They did not see that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman whom they despise, a whole city full were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. Look at that line again. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. We have far too many members when what we need are more missionaries. Now let's go back to that original statement. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. The first reason he needed to go through Samaria is for the sake of this individual woman. She was just at the right point in her religious experience, in her spiritual journey. The Holy Spirit was leading her deeper and deeper and closer to a reception of truth that Jesus knew that the time was now he needed to meet her. He needed to go through Samaria and meet this woman at the well. But through her, others came to Jesus, and the story goes on to say that he stayed there a couple days, and many believed on him. And a work was begun in Samaria by Jesus himself, but then Jesus left. Now, why did Jesus need to begin this work in Samaria? Well, I believe we find the answer in Acts chapter 8. Let's go to the book of Acts. Once Jesus had finished his mission on this earth, which of course was only three and a half years long, he then sent his disciples, now his apostles, and sent them out to be his messengers, his ministers, and to continue his work of ministry. And in Acts chapter 8, we see that a great persecution broke out in the church, and the members of the church were scattered and everywhere they went, well, let's just pick it up in chapter 8 and verse 4. Now, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So you get the picture. The church began in Jerusalem, but in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus has said it needs to go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then to all the ends of the earth. Up until Acts chapter 8, the church was almost exclusively located only in Jerusalem. But with the persecution that broke out in Acts chapter 8 at the stoning of Stephen... In Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen, and Acts chapter 8 records the scattering of the church members because of that persecution. And where do they go from Jerusalem? Well, they go to Judea and Samaria. Now, these are Jewish people who happen to accept Jesus as the Messiah running to Samaria for their lives. They're going to the land of their enemies and should not accept, expect a warm, hospitable Welcome. But look what we find in Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord, in, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And watch this now, verse 8. And there was great joy in that city. This is fascinating. Samaria receives the gospel message eagerly, with great joy. They didn't look at the disciples who came from Jerusalem and shun them and persecute them on another, another end here? No. Why was Samaria so ready to receive the message of Christ's ambassadors? Because of the very work that Jesus himself had begun in Samaria. In that book, Acts of the Apostles, comment on the success of the early church and its experience, page 106, we read, Christ's message to the Samaritan woman 
with whom he had talked at Jacob's well had borne fruit. After listening to his words, the woman had gone to the men of the city, saying, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went with her, heard Jesus, and believed on him. Anxious to hear more, they begged him to remain. For two days he stayed with them, and many more believed because of his own word. And when his disciples were driven from Jerusalem, some found in Samaria a safe asylum. The Samaritans welcomed these messengers of the gospel, and the Jewish converts gathered a precious harvest from among those who had once been their bitterest enemies. Fascinating. He needed to go through Samaria. He needed to for the sake of that one woman. He needed to for the sake of her friends whom she would reach, and she needed, he needed to for the sake of the disciples who would at one point be driven from Jerusalem and need to find safe haven in Samaria. And from the seed that Christ sowed in those couple of days, a great harvest resulted many days later. Conclusion? Friends, the harvest truly is ripe. And I can tell you right now that when we look around the world, we may look with the eyes of the disciples. We may look at people as not having potential, not being particularly interested in spiritual things, maybe in fact being opposed to our position on, as biblical Christians, and maybe even being uh, adverse to a conversation and adversarial. And we may think, well, the right thing to do is go around. The right thing to do is avoid contact. The best thing to do is just live and let live and go our separate ways. But Christ didn't give us that model. Now, he never told us to be obnoxious. He never told us to be rude. He never told us to be insincere. But he always told us to look at people as potential citizens of God's kingdom of heaven. Now, they may not be there now. They might be in a life of sin. They might be in discouragement. They might be in depression. They might be in anger. But we should look at people like Christ looked at that Samaritan woman, as someone whom the Holy Spirit can work on and can change into a child of God. We need to have the eyes of Jesus to see the need all around us. And instead of avoiding what might be difficult, may the Lord impress upon our hearts that we need to go through Samaria as well that we need to reach out to someone next to us. Or if we are just come to the faith, if we're new in the faith, or in fact, if we've been in the faith a long time, we need to have that same missionary spirit that that woman possessed. To go tell our friends, our family members, our coworkers, go tell strangers if you have to, the things that you know from the word of God and how the, how the, the Lord of the universe has changed your heart. Your personal experience with Jesus may be just what they need to hear. Friends, we each need to go through Samaria. We need to be better soul winners. We need to be more tactful. We need to be more open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to be Christ's messengers because the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. That's exactly what Jesus told his followers. Go back to our story in John chapter four. Those disciples who were so confused at what Jesus was doing, he explains in these words. Remember it says, then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has indeed, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not stay there still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Friends, we need to have the eyesight of Jesus to look out in this world and see that the field is white for harvest. To our natural perception, we may not see it, but that through the indwelling of Christ and the Holy Spirit's leading, we, like Jesus, can have divine appointments. Friends, let us look for the opportunities to tactfully and winsomely witness for Jesus Christ. May we be his laborers that there may be a great harvest. And when Christ comes, 
Not one will be missing. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for not only giving us the promise of salvation, but promising to make us your messengers to other people. Lord, help us to go through Samaria in our daily lives. Help us to watch for those divine appointments where your Holy Spirit is already working. Help us to look for soil that is ready to receive the word of truth. And Lord, when we have the opportunity, let us have that zeal, that missionary zeal that every true disciple is born in the kingdom of God with. Help us to be eager. Help us to be anxious. Help us to watch earnestly for souls who we can come in contact. Of course, the miracle of conversion we can't possibly do, but conversation we can do. So Lord, send us your Holy Spirit. Make us your messengers and your ambassadors today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.